by genocide. Climate change makes some people very angry. The world is going to end in 12 years if we don't address climate change. But at least one expert takes a more rational approach. Our resident skeptic, Bjorn Lomberg. Bjorn Lomberg says there are better things society should spend money on. For saying that, this climate alarmist hit him in the face with a pie. Just That's for lying about climate change. You're lying about climate change. He's later apologized, and now he's actually getting pied himself. But yes, fundamentally, a lot of people get very upset because if you feel very strongly about your particular area, and I come and say, actually, this is not a very efficient use of resources, I get why people get upset. But for our collective good, for all the stuff that we do on the planet, we actually need to have a conversation about where do we spend money well compared to where do we just spend money and feel virtuous about ourselves. And it turns out that some of these places we can spend money incredibly effectively. I went out on the street and asked people, governments are spending a lot of money trying to help people. What should they spend it on? The most common answer was climate change. I definitely think we need to fix the climate. Climate, I guess tackling climate change. That's what people think is the most important stuff. It's not surprising if you live in the rich world that you think some of the big problems of the world are things that you're talking about in the media, that you hear a lot about, like, for instance, climate change. This climate crisis is a fossil fuel crisis. I get why the politician makes bad decisions, but scientists hate you too. There's a lot of scientists who are very annoyed about uh, uh, my whole conversation in the, in the climate discussion. It's simply a question of saying, look, if you're a scientist, if you're a natural scientist, you, for instance, look at sea level rise, it'll rise because, you know, as temperatures get higher, seawater, just like everything else, expands. And so we're going to maybe see three feet of sea level rise. And then they say, so everybody who lives within those three feet of sea level, they'll have to move. Well, no, that's what a social scientist will tell you, and that's what I am. If you actually look at what people do, they build dikes. And so they don't actually have to move. And that's what we know most people will do. By building our dikes, we the Dutch have made it possible to live below sea level. If you actually look at the models, not just including sea level rise, but also including how people uh, address this, it shows that very, very few people are going to get inundated by the end of the century. It actually turns out, because we're also going to be much richer, that much, much fewer people are going to get flooded every year, despite the fact that you have much higher sea level rise. This is incontrovertible, but I get why if you're a scientist and you're like, but there's three feet of sea level rise coming. We should be really worried. Yes, it should. It is a concern, but it's not something we haven't fixed. And it's something we fixed very effectively and cheaply. Basically, 40% of Holland is below sea level. And the total cost for Holland over the last uh, half century is about 10 billion euros. So $10 billion. Not nothing, but again, very, very little of an advanced economy over 50 years. You made a movie about this. Cool it. We start washing our clothes with stones. I'm completely off electronics. Energy efficient light bulbs. Recycle more, drive hybrids. Are they serious? I don't know. I mean, it'd be fun to go back to them and, and hear if they're still off electronics. I would be surprised if they are. Recycle more, drive hybrids. I think in Hollywood, they are serious. Some of these things are great. For instance, hybrids, Great intervention. And, and look, people buy Priuses and like them because they actually give you better mileage and they don't cost more. That's great. This is the kind of innovation that we want because that makes it possible for you to use less energy more efficiently at lower cost. That's great. But what we're trying to do in many ways in our conversation on, on, on climate is to force people to be worse off at higher cost. And not surprisingly, that's really, really hard to sustain. So look, I love the fact that people want to do good. I would like them to also you know, just engage in thinking about how much good do they do. David Attenborough uh, once famously said that what he did for climate, this was before he got, became really worried about climate. Uh, he said that he would take out his charger at night, uh, his cell phone charger. And you know, the net effect of that is just zero in any meaningful way. But it made him feel good. For I think... saying things like that, Bjorn Lomberg is a traitor, the devil incarnate. This guy needs to be taken down. You put that in your movie. Bjorn Lomborg is a traitor. 
This guy needs to be taken down. Well, I didn't. It was my <laughs> my my director, right? But but it's it's true that a lot of people feel very strongly about this. If people had good arguments against me, they would make those arguments. And what they're really annoyed about, I think, is that he makes so much sense and he's making the wrong argument. You smile. I I don't. I get mad when people attack me. And is this because you're Danish or because you're a vegetarian or? Uh, I, think, so, I can't be like you. So somebody a long time ago told me that there's a famous saying at Harvard Law School, uh, which is, if you have a good case, you pound the case. But if you have a bad case, you pound the table. It always feels to me that when people are making these arguments against me, they're really just engaging in a lot of table pounding. And to me, and, and this may be why I'm smiling, in some sense, it proves my point. You know, they're just pounding the table. Okay, so you didn't have any good arguments. Look, it's not that these people are not well-meaning. I'm very happy that we have all these researchers that actually do a lot of the stuff that enables us to know what are the impacts of climate. And we certainly should be spending money on making sure that they're there and the, that information is there. But we also need to have that sort of connection between the, what the science tells us to what is actually going to be the human impact, which is what the natural, sorry, the natural sciences don't do very well, but what the social sciences do really, really well. We can't just have natural scientist uh, uh, advisors. Now, you would expect to hear that from a social scientist, right? But that is why uh, I think there's a lot of exaggerated alarmism from, uh, from much of the climate conversation. And I get why that gets people really worked up, but look, I'm not trying to be nasty. I'm not trying to be wrong. I'm not trying to do something that's immoral or anything. I'm simply trying to make sure that we get it right, both on climate and on all these other things. If we spend way too much money ineffectively on climate, not only are we not fixing climate, but we're also wasting an enormous amount of money that could have been spent on all these other things. I'm simply trying to make that simple point. And I think most people kind of get that, like, yeah, that doesn't sound entirely wrong. Your own Danish government. I know. Tried to take you down, called for scientific dishonesty. Yeah, it was a pretty terrible uh, experience. Some councils for scientific dishonesty in Denmark um, that were put up for medical research, uh, but they were increasingly being used as a way of just simply handing out, oh, we don't really like this or that or the other. And, and so they, they actually met up. They did a lot of uh, uh, flawed procedures and, and decided to say, Bjorn is not, we, we couldn't really be bothered to say exactly where Bjorn is wrong, but he clearly he said something that was politically incorrect. And so we're gonna give him a slap over the wrist. That was basically what they came out with. You know, sort of the establishment of Danish science where we're like, that that should not be allowed to be said out loud. Um, and, and of course, uh, because this was such a politically uh, 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 charged uh, atmosphere, uh, some other uh, uh, academics started a signature collection uh, where you get people to sign up to protest that, that decision and said that was terrible and wrong. And eventually it was overturned because uh, fortunately Danish law uh, uh, says that if you make a public decision, it has to be well justified. And it turned out that they had forgotten to uh, justify it. But what it tells you, I think, much, much clearer. So you know, eventually it was cleared. But, but I think more importantly, it tells you there's a lot of well-meaning people out there who just feels like, that doesn't belong in polite society. We, you know, we, we sort of reaffirm that climate change is our biggest challenge, and we reaffirm that we all want to go green, and we reaffirm all these truths that we know are important for good people. No, we don't. We reinforce the right ways that are effective and that actually helps people. And sometimes that's true. Sometimes it's what we're actually arguing. Sometimes it's not. Unfortunately, a lot of what we do is basically wasting lots of money and achieving virtually nothing. And that needs to be said. For more of my content, go to johnstossel.com. I post a new short video every Tuesday. That's at johnstossel.com. Your country, Denmark, is unusual in many ways. It keeps being cited as paradise where people are happier and Denmark is more green than America. When it comes to renewable energy, Denmark is aiming high. By 2020, the country hopes 50% of its energy will come from wind power. Look, I, <laughs> I'm Danish. I, I happen to think that Denmark has a lot of good qualities. Uh, and and but, but one of them, uh, I think, also comes with with uh, we have a sense of you don't stick out your neck, you don't uh, say something that doesn't fit in. Our uh, neighbor country, Sweden, they have this idea 
the, that there's a, a really tiny corridor of opinion that is acceptable, and then everything else you don't say. And I think that's actually a really good sort of explanation of how a lot of both Danish and Swedish society works. And clearly I'm, I'm out, outside of that acceptable corridor and, and making annoying arguments. Uh, but, you know, and, and I think that's one of the great opportunities in the US. You actually seem to relish that sort of conversation. And that's important because that's the only way that we're gonna move forward. Couldn't other countries be as green as Denmark? Get renewable energy? get two thirds of their electricity from renewables? It's much, much harder than you think, right? Denmark is situated in a place where there's lots of renewable energy from hydro from Sweden and Norway. And so basically what we- Water power. Yes, Damn. water power. So we're basically running our wind turbines and it's a very windy country. So when the wind is uh, blowing, we get all our electricity there. And then you stem all the water in Sweden and Norway. And then when there's no wind, you can use that as batteries. That's a great setup. And it actually gives pretty cheap power. So it's great for Denmark, but you can only do that in a fairly small part where you, are, where you have these batteries sort of installed uh, with, with hydropower. And of course, you can only do this for electricity. Remember, electricity is about a fifth of our total energy consumption. So all everybody's talking about is all the electricity, which is the easiest thing to switch over. But we don't know anything about how we're going to, or very, very little about how we're going to deal with the other four fifths. And that's, of course, why Denmark still uses lots of fossil fuel like every other rich country. We use slightly less than what we used to do, and that's nice. But we're not showing the way in the sense of saying, is there a way you can be rich and not emit CO2? Because no, what are you going to do about all these other things where we use uh, energy mostly from fossil fuel? And what are the four fifths? This is uh, energy that we use on things that are very, very hard to replace. So it's uh, a fertilizer that keeps uh, you know, 4 billion people alive. Uh, making the fertilizer. Making the fertilizer. It's uh, steel, it's cement, it's industrial processes. Most of heating uh, we use uh, from, uh, from fossil fuels. Uh, most uh, uh, transportation is fossil fuels. And all of that, even if you were perfect and we were perfect, it really wouldn't make a difference because of China and India. No, it would make very small difference. Remember, if the US went entirely net zero today and stayed that way for the rest of the century. Remember how incredibly uh, uh, extreme this would be. First of all, you wouldn't be able to feed everyone in the US. The whole economy would break down. You wouldn't know how to get transportation. A lot of people would freeze. Some people would you know, fry. There would be lots and lots of problems. But even if you did this and managed to do it, the net impact, if you run it through the UN climate model, is that you would reduce temperatures by the end of the century by 0 0.3 degree Fahrenheit. We would almost not be able to measure it by the end of the century. It would have virtually no impact. And the reason is that most of the emissions in this century is not going to come from rich countries. It's going to come from China, India, and Africa. And they, of course, have much different and much more immediate concerns. They want to get their populations out of poverty. They want to deal with all the problems that we've already fixed. It's easy enough for us to say that we want to go net zero, although we're not actually going to manage to do that because we're not going to be willing to pay for it. But it's absolutely impossible to imagine that these countries would want to go there first before they- They're still their building coal plants. Exactly. And for, for good reason, because coal is an incredibly cheap way to deliver lots of predictable power. Now, again, one of the things you need to do with coal power is to reduce the air pollution because air pollution from coal power is terrible. And we've fixed that. You know, you put scrubbers on the, on the, uh, on the smokestacks. That's not costless, but it's fairly cheap and it saves a lot of lives. So that's certainly something you should do. They're doing it in China. They're increasingly doing it in India, not, not really in Africa. Yes, we should do that first. Then eventually we want them to do just like the US, switch from coal to gas through fracking. Gas emits about half as much CO2 as, as, as coal. If gas is cheaper, everyone switched. That's what the US did. The US has cut its carbon emissions more than any other country in the whole world over the last 10 years because of fracking. So we need to get fracking more out there. And then of course we want to get more innovation so that eventually you have other green technologies that will be able to take over and really green technologies that will allow us to go to net zero. But this is not going to happen in 10, 20, 30 years. We're more talking about half to a full century. Our politician, Bernie Sanders, keeps citing 
your country is the model for democratic socialism. They have gone a long way toward eliminating poverty to provide a secure, decent standard of living for the overwhelming majority of their people. Healthcare is a right of all people. College education, graduate school is free uh, in those countries. Yeah. Well, first of all, we're not a socialist country. We're very actually a, a capitalist society, but we have a strong social security net, which is one of the reasons why you can have people relatively easily fired. Because if you have a security net, people will allow you to have also a vibrant capitalistic society. So we have, you know, again, you're talking to a guy who actually likes sort of Denmark, right? We have a very good and efficient way of having capitalism that doesn't lead to uh, a lot of social problems, but it's not a socialist paradise. It's a very efficient uh, and, and uh, relatively equitable capitalist society. Back to climate change. The people all over the world are scared. The activists seem a little more willing to destroy things in Europe. And there are these protests because people really believe they have no future. Yes. AOC said. The world is going to end in 12 years if we don't address climate change. They're genuinely scared. Yes. A new OECD survey shows that 60% of all people in rich countries now believe it's likely or very likely that unmitigated climate change will lead to the end of mankind. This is what you get when you have constant fear mongering in the media. So again, uh, when we look at the sea level rise talk, uh, if you don't look at what happens when we actually protect ourselves, you believe that 187 million people are gonna get flooded. Well, this you're is, not gonna watch if I say sea level's rising, but we but can deal with it. But it's not a big problem, yes. No, exactly. But the reality is the 187 million people being flooded because of sea level rise was a headline in New York Times, in Washington Post, in most papers around the world, and it regularly is. But what they don't tell you is that's not going to happen because actually we will protect ourselves and very cheaply so. The problem here is unmitigated scaremongering leads to more action on climate, which is, of course, one of the political goals for this, but it leads often to ineffective political action because you're like, we got to do something right now. We got to do it next year and not postpone anything any, any longer. Whereas the reality is this is something that will take half to a full century. And we need to understand that we're not doing it well by scaring everyone. Apart from that, of course, scaring everyone is just terrible. I mean, it leads to a lot of kids saying, why would I want to have an education when the world is going to end in 10 or 20 years? But we need Why your education. Why would I want to have children? Yeah, we need your education. We need your kids to make sure that the future is better. Climate change may cause more deaths from heat. And that's reported all the time. They don't mention fewer deaths from coal. No. It's, and yet it's, cold, cold kills cold more kill. people. Much more people. So this is one of the great examples of how we have very selective reporting. So as temperatures go up, we're likely to see more people die from heat. That's absolutely true, and you hear this all the time. But what is sorely underreported is the fact that nine times as many people die from cold. So we estimate about half a million people die from heat, but 4.5 million people die from cold. And as temperatures go up, you're also going to see fewer people die from cold. So it turns out that over the last 20 years, because of uh, temperature rises, we have seen about 116,000 more people die from heat but 283,000 fewer people die from cold. Overall, we have 166,000 fewer people dying from, from heat and cold. Why is that not reported? Well, because it's not a good story. It's, it's it also is a good story. It's also partly because you don't see the people who die from cold because they die over long periods of time. Uh, when, when you die from cold, you typically die because you sit in a home that's not quite warm enough, and your so your uh, your blood vessels constrict, you get high blood pressure, and so you have higher risk of dying from uh, a heart disease. But this is you know this takes perhaps a month or so, whereas a heat wave happens right there and then. It happens within a few days. A lot of people die, so it, you know it shows up on TV much better. But it doesn't mean it's not the reality. We should be reporting the reality. And you wrote about this, and Facebook censored you. Yes. Why? 
So Facebook has some really strong centers that are very, very clearly very climate worried. Uh, so they, they actually had a, a pediatrician from Boston who has found his calling in, in, uh, in climate alarmism, who said that that is totally wrong. And he misinterprets the article without any argument. It was just, it, it was basically a statement of saying, this is wrong. Uh, and, and then Facebook can say, see, he's wrong because this pediatrician in Boston says he's wrong. No, the article, the, even the authors themselves argue that yes, overall, because of temperature rises, we've seen increases in heat deaths, we've seen larger decreases in cold deaths. How is that not the relevant point here? But no, there are simply things you're allowed to say and things you're not allowed to say on Facebook. And I think it's very, very problematic in the long run for society that we have these censors who very clearly have political intentions that actually allow you to say there are only certain things you can see on Facebook. Facebook has pulled back on some of its censorship. You can now say that COVID may have begun in the lab in China. But these Pointer Institute approved climate zealots. Fact checkers should be more committed to correcting the record than anyone else. They're still there. Yeah. And I don't know how to how to deal with that. Again, I would love to fix all the world's problems. I'm just trying to fix a few of them. Uh, but I, I, I'm very happy that you tried to uh, uh, get Facebook uh, more uh, responsible for this. And the media say climate change is responsible for just about everything bad. Yeah. I mean, we have some examples. As global temperatures continue to rise, it could spark new coronavirus-like pandemics. It would be impossible to overstate the impact that climate change unchecked will have on our mental health. You can now draw a line of extremism from coast to coast across the African continent and connect it to climate change. Yeah, I mean, it's very, very easy to make this argument that everything is caused by climate change because there's some, some sort of connection to all of these things to different impacts from climate change. My, my point is to say we're not well informed if you don't have the full part of the picture. So very clearly, uh, uh, for instance, heat deaths are impacted by climate ch uh, change, but so is cold deaths. And only reporting on one side of that, uh, one of the strongest evidences of climate impacts is temperature rise, sea level rise, you hear this about constantly, and greening of the planet that the world gets greener. This was an article in Nature magazine that said these are the three main indicators of climate change. But you only hear about the two at first because they are problematic. You don't hear about the third because that's good that we get more green stuff on the planet. We've over the last what 30 years, we've got about three continent of, of, the, U, of the size of the US more leaves in the world. How cool is that? Look, again, my argument here is not that climate change is great or that it's uh, overall positive. It's simply that just like every other thing, it has pluses and minuses. Climate change has more minuses than pluses. That's why it's a problem. But only reporting on the minuses and only emphasizing the worst case outcomes is not a good way to inform people. So now you've written best things first, the 12 most efficient solutions. The world is wasting money on inefficient solutions. The world spends a lot of money on a lot of different things. Look, again, we're rich. And so a lot of people feel like you can spend money on many different things. And that's true. What I'm making the argument for in this book is for fairly little money, we could do amazing good. Just, you know, the bottom line is if we spent $35 billion, not trillion dollars, $35 billion, which is not nothing. And I don't think neither you or I have that amount of money. But, you know, in the big scheme of things, this is a rounding error. $35 billion could save 4.2 million lives in the poor part of the world each and every year and make the poor world $1.1 trillion richer. That's almost a dollar per person per day in the poor part of the world. This is just fantastic good. This is what we should do first. $35 billion a year. That's a fraction of what our agriculture department spends yeah, yeah. uselessly. I don't know whether they spend all of it uselessly, but the fun fundamental point is we have so much money and there is so little we need to spend incredibly effectively. And in the book, I make the point that the $35 billion is equivalent to the increase in our spending on cosmetics over the last two years. 
yeah, we can probably afford then also to make sure that we actually spend $35 billion to basically save a, a seventh of everyone who dies in the poor part of the world. So why do we spend so much more on things like climate change that will barely make a difference? Because this is the conversation that we have when we're rich. Look, if you are already safe, your kids are not you know, in danger of dying from curable uh, infectious diseases or all these other problems, then you can worry about fractions of degree in 100 years. I get that. And you know, I'm glad that we're rich and we can afford to think about that. But we also need to remember, and I think we have a moral responsibility to remember, that there are lots and lots of people, so mostly about 6 billion people out there, who don't have this luxury of being able to think 100 years ahead and think about a little bit of a, of a fraction of a degree, who wants to make sure that their kids are safe. We could do that very, very cheaply. And so the next money we spend should probably be on these very simple and cheap policies. How do you know what to spend on? <laughs> so we spent, we spent a lot of time working with a lot of economists to try to look across all the different areas that you could spend money on and ask, what are the costs? What are the benefits? And so we have worked really hard to make sure that we've identified the very best policies. We're very sure these are incredibly good policies, for instance, as maternal and newborn health. Uh, so I didn't know that before I started this process, but every year about 300,000 moms die in childbirth and about 2.3 million kids die in their first 28 days on Earth. We could do something about this. This is not, again, rocket science. We could help these moms not die from cheap and simple interventions. It's about getting them into institutional birth and making sure that you have obstetric care for them. This is very, very cheap. And likewise, we can save a lot of these kids. For instance, about 5% of all kids that are born also in the rich world don't start breathing on their own. And so you actually have to give them a positive uh, air pressure. You have to put in air in their lungs. Uh, we do this routinely in, in rich world countries. You need a resuscitator, a little hand pump in the poor part of the world. It costs $75 and it can save, what, 25 lives over the next three years uh, in that particular hospital. Why aren't we doing that? That would save about 700,000 kids. Overall, we estimate that for about $5 billion, you could save 166,000 moms and you could save 1.2 million uh, uh, newborns. This is just a no-brainer. We would do $87 of good for every dollar we spend. This is just one of those things we should do. If I, if I can just take one more example, get better education to the about half a billion kids that are in primary school right now in low and low middle income countries. They are in school, but they are learning virtually nothing. So one of the examples that you give to these kids, they're 10 year old kids, you ask them to re read the sentence. So it says, VJ has a red hat, blue shirt and yellow shoes. What color is the hat? Now, the right answer is red, right? But 80% of kids can't make that determination. It's because they've technically learned to read, but they can't string these words together and actually make a sentence out of it. What we need to do is to teach them much better. The problem with most education, as, and this is true across the world, is that we put all the 12 year olds in one grade and all the 13 year olds in one grade. But within this grade, within the sixth grade, they're vastly different, especially in poor countries. Some of these kids are at sixth grade level. Some of them are at first grade level. The solution, and we know this, this is very well known and it's been tested in a lot of different ways, is to teach each one of these kids at their own level. Now, you can't do that with one teacher because obviously if you have 50 kids, you have to sort of you know, just teach down the middle in some way. But you can do that if you put them, and this is one of the solutions, you put these kids in front of a tablet with educational software one hour a day. That one hour, the tablet knows whereabouts you are as an individual. Oh, you're really far ahead or wow, you have no idea what's going on. And then teaches you from that starting point. Then you move on and you go you know, back to the boring old classes that you have normally and someone else comes in and use the tablet. So this tablet is used really efficiently. If you do this over a year, it'll cost about $30 per kid per year. And the benefit is that that kid will learn about three years as much as what the kid would normally have learned in school. This is a phenomenal outcome. Of course, that means this kid will become much more productive in uh, his or her adult life, make their nation much better off, and everybody will win. The cost is about $10 billion. The benefit 
is about $600 billion. It's 65 times back on each dollar spent. Again, it's just something we should do. As you did this research, you said that people didn't want to hear about the stupid things they were doing. Yeah. But I want to hear about them. What are the stupid things we spend billions on? One of the very clear stupid things that people are doing is uh, in many uh, poor countries, and for instance, India, you uh, forgive loans. Uh, so if you want to get elected, yeah, you know, lots of smallhold farmers have loans. And then you go out and say, if you vote for me, I'm going to forgive your loans. And of course, it gets you a lot of votes. And yeah, you know, it's not different from how you, many politicians in rich world countries hand out money for elections. But what it does, of course, is it actually makes all the banks really, really annoyed because they're not going to lend this to, again, in principle, you'd actually imagine they get all the money. But of course, when the person comes into power, they will eventually have to pay off the loans, but typically it takes five or 10 years. And so the banks are basically saying, we're not going to do that again. Uh, and so the smallhold farmers end up not getting loans, which you need if you're actually going to grow your business. And so it's a bad outcome for everyone, but it's a great outcome for the guy who promises this. So this happens in a lot of places. In India, uh, one year it costs more than half a percentage point of the entire Indian economy. For more of my content, go to johnstossel.com. I post a new short video every Tuesday. That's at johnstossel.com. What's another example of stupid spending? So we promise, for instance, to cut carbon emissions so much that we get down to one and a half or two degrees centigrade. That's probably a really bad investment. So it actually means we spend a dollar and we do less good for the world. When people say they want to do that, and when rich countries are actually trying to do that, it's going to cost them hundreds of billions and maybe trillions, depending on the size of their economy. And it's going to generate much less benefit for the environment. So fundamentally, that's also a bad idea. Why should I believe you? The UN has thousands of people working on this. And you disagree with them. Well, I'm actually not disagreeing as much as I'm simply saying some of these goals are fantastic. Some of them are only so-so. Let's do the fantastic first. Remember, the UN originally just simply promised everything to everyone. And in, uh, in 2000 and, and from 2016 to 30, we basically promised to do everything. We're going to get rid of poverty, hunger, disease. We're going to fix war, corruption, climate change. Uh, we're going to fix education. We're also going to throw in uh, you know, organic apples and community gardens and everything else you can think of. It's all in there. And not surprisingly, when you promise everything to everyone, you're going to fail because there's no way we can deliver all of this by 2030. And so our argument is simply to say, if you don't, if you can't do it all, why don't we do the smart stuff first? Now, the UN is instead doubling down and saying, look, we're actually failing right now. We're not delivering what we promised. So the world has to come up with another half a trillion dollars every year in what they call a, uh, a stimulus package for the Sustainable Development Goals. First of all, the world doesn't have half a trillion dollars lying around. Secondly, half a trillion dollars is not going to cut it. The, you know, the estimates seem to indicate we need sort of 10 to 15 trillion dollars per year to actually deliver everything that's been promised. And, and that's, of course, not achievable. Remember, the total tax intake of the entire world is about 13 trillion dollars. The UN is essentially talking about saying, let's get all of that money for our causes. So I'm not disagreeing with them that these are all nice things. I'm simply saying this is not going to happen. If it's not, let's do the smart stuff first. 20 years ago, the UN came out with development goals that did help. Yes. So, so the UN back in 2000 set the so-called Millennium Development Goals, which were very simple and very straight up. They basically said, let's get people out of poverty, out of hunger, Let's get kids into school. Let's stop moms and let's stop kids from dying. That was very, very simple. And, you know, we didn't achieve all of it and certainly not all of it. For instance, the poverty uh, reduction happened to a large extent, not because of the UN, but because of China coming out of, of, of poverty. But much of it actually because happened. Because capitalism Absolutely. just on its own lifts well, people of up. Of course. This, you know, fundamentally, you're only going to fix poverty by having lots and lots of growth. But there's also some things, for instance, back in, in 1990, about 12 million kids died before their fifth birthday every year. In 2015, partly because of what we promised, only 6 million kids died. 
So we've literally saved six million kids. Some of it was general development, some of it was that we, people got out of poverty, but some of it was simply because we managed to get them inoculated so they don't die from measles and other things that we know how to deal with, that we got a lot more food and we made sure that these kids were just better able to survive. So we did something when we promised concentrated and simple things. But when you promise everything to everyone, there's no incentive to do any one thing. Top of your list, tuberculosis. People in America don't even talk about that. Tuberculosis used to be the biggest killer in the world. It killed over the last 200 years about a billion people. So every fourth person in the 1800s in rich countries died from tuberculosis. And then we fixed it. We know how to fix tuberculosis. So nobody in rich world countries die from tuberculosis. But in poor countries, they still do. So 1.4 million people die from tuberculosis every year. These are mostly disenfranchised, poor people. They're often without voice. And it's something that we could easily do something about. So what we're saying is if you spend about $5.5 billion, which again is not nothing, but in the big scheme of things, a very small sum, you could save most of those people. You could actually save about a million people each and every year uh, till 2050. Why don't we do this? We know how to fix it. And the simple point is we, you need to get people better able to take their medication. You actually have to take the medication for half a year, which is hard. I mean, if you've ever tried to take a medication for two weeks, you know, you sort of start to forget. And then you also need to make sure that everybody get diagnosed. So there's a lot of undiagnosed tuberculosis out there. We need to do that. That costs money, but it's something we know how to do. Malaria, something else. Americans don't think about. Yeah, malaria was endemic in 36 states in the United States in 1900s, up to about 1940. This is something that we have developed out of. Why wouldn't we want to make sure that the rest of the world develops out of this? Most of the malaria now is in Africa. And this is basically about getting more mosquito nets out so that you sleep under insecticide treated uh, bed nets that both keeps the mosquitoes out at night but also when the mosquitoes try and sit on the, uh, on the net, they actually die from the insecticide. So this is very simple. We know how to do it. $1.1 billion could save about uh, uh, 260,000 people each and every year. But it's insecticide. It kills bugs. And a lot of people in the environmental movement say it will kill people too. These are bad chemicals. If you think about how the U.S. got rid of malaria, you spray DDT pretty much everywhere. Uh, and, and DDT is not something we should generally be putting out everywhere. It's certainly not in the environment. But you know, if your kids are dying from it, you probably want to do this. So it's again a trade-off and it's very easy for us to sit in very well uh, 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 cooled or heated homes and, and with no other concerns and say, oh, you should be careful about the insecticides. Of course you should. And remember again, we're not using DDT. We're using much less damaging uh, insecticides. And we're no longer talking about spraying it out in the environment because it turns out that it's really, really hard to do that well. Uh, you just end up spraying a lot of, of stuff and it still doesn't kill all the mosquitoes. But insecticide treated nets have very little residual insecticide. They're fairly cheap, so they cost somewhere between two and a half and four dollars per, uh, per net. And they last for three years and they keep, simply save children from dying. And, and of course, remember, uh, malaria, unlike tuberculosis, a lot of people get malaria and don't die from it. It's a terrible disease to get. Uh, I haven't had it, but I, I you know, talked to a lot of people who had it. And you, know, you suffer for days and possibly weeks, and that makes you a lot less productive as well. So you can get malaria you know, through your lifetime uh, some 40, 60 times. And so you become much less productive apart from also uh, sometimes dying from it. We could avoid both. It's just simply a great idea. Land security. So one of the things you don't think about is imagine if you didn't know if you owned your house or your apartment. Somebody, you know, you put in a new kitchen, you feel all wonderful about it, and then somebody comes and says, actually, this is not your house. That's totally unthinkable in rich countries. Yet about a billion people in the poor part of the world don't know if they're gonna stay where they live, they're gonna have their land, 
And if they're going to have their house, that's a terrible Because they situation. don't have a deed and they don't know that the government yeah. isn't going to take it from Be them? Because, well, it's not the government. Typically, it's other people who will say, actually, my grandfather used to own. There's just not good deeds. They're not good legal surrounding for who owns what. And so what you need is to have better land security, that you actually own your land or you own your, uh, your house. The benefit, of course, is if you don't know if you own your land, you don't want to plant trees that will only come to fruition in five or 10 years because you don't know if they're going to be yours by then. But if you do, you're going to start putting in irrigation. You're going to start making the soil better. You're going to be more productive. And so this, again, is a simple thing. It requires political will apart from money and, and some parts, you know, because the political people are also the ones who benefit from being able to distribute uh, land to their political favorites. Uh, that might be problematic. But where you can get this going, for instance, in Rwanda, they have done this, uh, you can basically get everybody registered. You can make sure that people have it. You make uh, you know, surveys in little village councils. You'll come in and you know line up and say, this is your land. And and some other people will say, no, I don't think. You know, and then you'll debate it out. And, and hopefully you'll get so, some sort of resolution. So now suddenly everybody knows who owns what. And of course, also development only happens when most people don't work the land. Remember, in the rich world, we have, what, one or two percent who work all the land in the U.S., and the rest of us do st other stuff, and we're just happy that somebody's actually making the food for us. We need the same sort of movement in the long run from in the developing world. And that's only going to happen if you know you own your land so you can sell it to someone else so that you can go to the city and become productive in other ways. Trade. Yes. Trade is one of those things that we've stopped talking about in the rich world. Remember, trade... Well, rich people talk about stopping trade. Yeah, stopping... The Chinese are yeah. ripping us off. Exactly. And, and, and look, I think economists made a mistake, and I, I've been one of those guys just saying, oh, trade is wonderful. Remember, trade fundamentally is great because it means that you can do what you do best, I do what I do best, and then we trade and we both end up better off for it. But what we forgot to tell is that when you have a trade situation and you know if you're a rich country and then you open up for trade from say Bangladesh they come with lots and lots of cheap t-shirts if you're sewing t-shirts in you know in the US you're screwed and that's a real issue and so we need to emphasize that so we've done the first uh, academic study that actually looks not just on what are the benefits of trade which is substantial but also who suffers and how much and it turns out that not surprisingly, while rich countries get the biggest part of the benefit from trade because they have the biggest economies, they also have the biggest costs. And so benefit-cost ratio on trade for rich countries is only $7. So that is every $7 you get of benefit from trade, somebody also suffers a loss in income or in jobs of $1. So there's real, you know, sort of uh, rust belt uh, problems with trade for rich countries. And if you're selling those t-shirts, you bear it all. Yes, yes. But of course, in reality, you will shift to other, uh, uh, you will shift to other trades. Some people stay unemployed for the rest of their lives, but most people will get re-educated or move over. But they will probably suffer short-term or even medium-term losses. And those are real, and we need to emphasize those. But even for rich countries, there's much more benefit than there's cost. So, you know, $7 for every $1 of loss. We should certainly think about how we redistribute that better so that the people who are, uh, who are suffering from, from trade also get, you know, the offer of re-education and so on. But the crucial bit here is for the poor half of the world, the benefits are 95 to 1. So that's fundamentally all upside with trade. And that's, of course, why we need to remember if you actually want to do good for the world, trade is one of those places that will help lift millions and possibly even billions of people out of poverty. Skilled migration. Most people in the poor part of the world make a lot less money than the same kind of people would do in the rich world. So, you know, take a McDonald's worker in, in Somalia. Uh, he or she will do pretty much the same thing as a McDonald's worker in New York, but they'll make, what, one seventeenth of the income. That's just simply because when you move to a rich country, you become much more productive. And because you work together with a lot of other much more productive people. So we have lots of evidence that seem to indicate that having more migration is good for the economy. But what economists tend to forget is that there's also a huge 
political issue with migration. You know, just having lots and lots of people migrate freely might make the economic pie bigger, but it also creates lots of social problems. But one of the things that most people agree on is that skilled migration is a good thing. If you have more doctors coming in, especially in rich countries, that means you, you will have better health care, that you will have more opportunity, that you will have better uh, opportunities for these doctors to be uh, doing their specialities, and that means that they'll end up giving you better How service. does it help the poor if they leave so, the poor country? So it actually helps the poor both in the sense that these were poor doctors that now move and become much more effective and much richer. So that actually helps in global inequality. But it also means that they will send back remittances to these countries that are much larger than the loss incurred from not having these doctors. So overall, this turns out to be a much better deal. We're simply suggesting a, a politically realistically uh, solution of saying 10% more of skilled migration than what you already have. So if you're Canada that has lots of migration, you're probably willing to take in 10% of a large number. If you're a country that's more sort of reserved about uh, uh, migration, you'll take in 10% of a much, much lower number. This, is, this will cost about two and a half billion dollars mostly actually in poor countries, but the benefits will be in the order of $50 billion a year. So again, one of the great investments for the world. Your chart showing costs versus benefits is impressive. What you're saying is what we've been doing is about the opposite? Well, it's more that if you're a politician and you look at 10 different problems, your sort of natural inclination is to say, let's give one tenth to each one of them. And economists would tend to say, no, Let's give all of the money to the most efficient problem first, and then to the second most efficient problem, and so on. I'm simply suggesting there's a way that we could do much better with much less. That ought to be something that everybody would love, but of course it also means that a lot of people's favorite thing might not be the first thing that gets funded. Thank you for trying to bring people the truth. Thank you. Thanks for listening. New episodes drop the first and third Mondays of every month. You can subscribe everywhere you get podcasts.